Today we're in the Grovant Wilderness headed over to a place called Blue Miner Lake with a truck driving by and then on up to a mountain called locally Sleeping Indian but the proper name is Sheep Mountain. I'll show a picture during the show about why you might consider it called the Sleeping Indian but the goal is to camp overnight in the back. You can see my fishing pole behind me because the Forest Service says there are fish up at Blue Miner Lake. We'll see what it is. So this is a supposed to be a relatively easy jaunt even though going to the top of the mountains over 11,000 feet so <laughs> we'll see what happens. I'm already all slathered with sunscreen and bug spray and prepared for the backcountry. Uh, backpack, trekking poles, you know, sunglasses and the critical, let's even get it out here, bear spray. Anytime you are in the wilderness in Grand Teton, Yellowstone, or anywhere else, you gotta have this bear spray because when the bear comes after you, you wanna be able to hose them down. Because the theory is that bear spray ends a bear encounter in about 90-95% of the time, whereas the firearm only ends in 50% of the time, and usually a dying bear is a very mad bear versus a chemical spray bear. Eh, they just run away. It doesn't really hurt them. It's no big deal. So just a consideration when you're on the backcountry. Safety is key. Always make sure you let somebody know where you go, what your plan is. Make sure you can communicate that you've changed your plan. All those standard rules of being in the backcountry because you don't want to have to do the Aaron Ralston maneuver of hacking off your hand with a dull Swiss Army knife. Ugh. So off we go into the hike. And not after about 10 minutes of hiking, you can actually see the location that you're headed for. It's quite a ways away. I don't know, seven miles or whatever it is over rolling hills and then a good 5,000 feet of gain, but no problem. All right, uh, so one of these things about the trail back here, at least so far, is it's actually marked. So you end up going the right way, which is behind me, versus who knows where that goes. It probably all ends up in the same place, but just be mindful when you cross trail junctions and things, make a note, because when you come back, it all looks different. And even though you can barely see it, the Grand Teton and the Cathedral Group, just past this red rock, if it was clear, definitely would be nice. One of the natural challenges of doing hikes in the Rockies and Sierras and mountains is running into creeks. It's great for water, but not for crossing. So if you've got boots, it's maybe good if you've got super waterproof, but you get wet feet this early. Oh, so I'm gonna try and find a location to get across this thing. See if we can figure this all out without taking it into the drink. And about half hour into it, you start doing switchbacks to start making up these hills. Some people complain about switchbacks, but actually they're the best thing because humans are power controlled rather than energy controlled. If you do things slow enough but persistent enough, you'll always get them done. But if you try and zoom through too quick, you'll burn out. So switchbacks are a good thing. Each of those creek crossings is no problem until you actually have to try and film it and concentrate on not falling in. <laughs> Way back in the woods, somebody's tiny little cabin. There's a two track that goes up to it. Of course, through private property, but uh, if you're in your little cabin getaway, get permission, that would be pretty cool. And here we are, about an hour, and some change, it's a midway backpack, Grizzly Lake Trail, Blue Miner Lake, not too shabby. Good place to stop, grab a bite, slug some water, keep on going. All right, here we are, Grove in the Wilderness. It's funny, you think you see the wilderness sign, you're in the wilderness. No, this is the official sign, and when you get here, no drones, no bikes, no no nothing. You, pack horses, mechanical power, it's 
part of the wilderness experience and it definitely feels like it. <laughs> Ah, so you get to locations like this. We get a nice little rocky ledge and overlook. Boy, this is this is the thing that makes some of this effort and sweat and bug bites all worth it. <laughs> One of the fun parts about this experience is a swarm of flies and mosquitoes and black flies. You go mad. You actually want to take bug juice and just rub it in your hair because they, they're crawling all over you. It's like ah, oh. you smear it all over. You taste it. Ah, oh, but at least the bugs go away. Yes. <laughs> It's nice because it's on a ridge, so you get a good view most of the way, but the, the bugs are a little bit intense. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately there's smoke and whatnot here, but it's just part of the Rocky Mountains nowadays. So you come in, you know, July through August. It's pretty good conditions, definitely toasty, even though it's maybe only 83 degrees. It feels really hot, but that's an altitude effect, so, so far so good. Nothing like the beauty of walking through a flower field. <sighs> Once you get up to this plateau here, you start going through this, I guess this old growth forest and definitely old. And a lot of these trees are totally dead. And uh, you know, someday there'll be a forest fire through here and repeat the cycle, but. It's kind of interesting. It looks like one of those spooky old forests, especially late in their day. Woo! <laughs> one of the challenges of this hike is water management. Because you cross a couple creeks, it's all flowing, and then once you hit a couple switchbacks and start heading up, no water. It's, it's a long ways away, so it's uh, pretty toasty today. I've been sweating up a storm. <laughs> Don't exactly look fresh, but uh, I've got uh, what uh, had started off with nearly three liters, and I'm down to less than a liter. So if it's really toasty, you tend to drink a lot. I would uh, maybe recommend slamming some water at the start of the trailhead and maybe even tanking up at a creek if you start draining through it because it's a good long ways to the the lake I'm still not there yet but uh, part of the experience even though it's beautiful and the flowers behind me are incredible it's dry so it's not even like you cross a creek or anything so be mindful of that when you're heading out towards Blue Miner Lake and on your way to Sleeping Indian or Sheep Mountain or whatever Sheep Mountain. One of the interesting parts about this hike is that you're hiking this beautiful field of flowers. It's not that humid, which is nice. But way the heck over there, hopefully you can see it. It's super dry. It's just a sheer rock face. So it's weird being at the same elevation where there are a bunch of flowers and beauty and then brutal rock deeper in the Grovant wilderness. It's kind of peculiar about this place because usually when you're going through the forest, you stay at the same level. You look across and it's about the same condition. But boy, in this place, Phew, rock. Hey, 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 here we are. The challenge is you're quite a ways up above that lake. Ah. So, even though, oh, crud. Even though you've hiked up this hill and it's like, oh, it's great. You gotta go all the way back down the lake. <laughs> I was like, no, because either you got to go up from the lake to go out or go up over Sleeping Indian. Classic wilderness trip. Ah, as soon as you start going down that ridge, trekking poles, definitely a bonus. This thing is steep. Woo. So that means coming up, <laughs> yeah, going to be kind of a grind. That's what you got to look forward to. <laughs> Once you get off that steep section of the trail, then you hit this nice little, I think, spruce sort of forest and a little bit more calm, not so crazy, not quite down at the water yet, but you can start seeing a little bit better. The trail's a little more enjoyable. Of course, it's always on your mind. Man, I went down that, I gotta go back up that? <laughs> yeah.
but quite nice starting to get into some granite rocky areas and kind of keep looking down so I don't eat it here. Although that would be pretty funny filming. <laughs> On the final approach to Blue Miner Lake, when you hang that left corner, boom, you see the water and yeah, you are here! Actually, it looks really pretty with the rocky side on one side and then some protection and trees on the other. We'll walk down here. Hopefully the video is not too bouncy. A little breezy though, which is good. You never know what you'll find hanging a tree like a hip socket from some large animal. Kind of weird. Ah, so <laughs> that is one of the challenges of when you're hiking to a particular destination where even though this is the wilderness, I haven't seen anybody all day, there's another campsite right near, totally great, and then the music comes on. Some people like it, some people don't. Ugh. But if you want to hear the crows and ravens and everything chirp and uh, <laughs> kind of the nature of the world beyond, you never know what you're going to show up with, but hey, maybe they'll share some drinks, who knows. <laughs> So at uh, Blue Miner Lake here, it's real pretty. It actually has a very distinctive blue color, so I was wondering, I should ask the Forest Service what uh, causes that. Hmm, hopefully it's not arsenic. <laughs> uh, but uh, home away from home here, no problems. I've used this tarp tons of times in the Sierras and Rockies and snowstorms and rain and so far so good, because people worry, oh, well, doesn't this uh, not protect you from bears? If you think thin nylon on a tent is going to protect you from bears, you have a very tough tent. Not going to happen. So keep your bear spray handy. Uh, breathe in. Uh, uh, breathe in a mosquito or two. And the key is make sure to cook in some rocks farther away. But ideally, it would be downwind. But the wind's been swirling around, so uh, I, I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll see in a bit. I'm going to get some food going, but I've got water going. Right now, I've got this uh, chlorine dioxide mix. It's pretty handy. You just put some drops in here, wait five minutes, pour it in, and 15 minutes, uh, maybe half an hour if the water's cold. Chlorine dioxide kills everything. Uh, very low probability of anything going wrong. You just put those drops in, choo -choo 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 -choo. wait five minutes. I mean, the, the only way you can have anything go wrong with that kit is if you lose them or break the bottles. I like the other kits, the speed's better, but uh, it's always a tough balance. So, you know, your mileage may vary. Chlorine dioxide's used by municipal water supplies, so you know that works. So, I like it so far. Well, let's see how we do. <laughs> Maybe I should lower it even more. <laughs> Oh, here we are in the tarp tent, hunkered down, oh, in the rainstorm. Looks like the lightning has passed. That was kind of scary. I was thinking about going up on the ridge and camp. Oh, thank goodness. I mean, the lightning was hitting dead on the ridge. That would have been bad. So, down here by Blue Miner Lake, it's a little bit rainy. I've always been thinking about getting that other tarp that's a little bit bigger, keep the splash off, and I can lower it down a bit. I'm going to have to do that because this will, uh, <laughs> this is on the very edge. If the rain starts driving, I'm going to be in trouble. Of course, everything turns muddy, but hopefully the rain will pass, so I might have to increase the size of my tarp. This is okay, but I could feel my hand over here. I could feel it splashing. Yeah, I've got my clothes in the garbage bag, so it's all good. It's uh, quite the experience being in the Grovon Wilderness and a passing rain squall and 
Just hanging out. You know, it's like 8.45, so it's summer. Sun doesn't set till 9 o'clock. Uh, one trick is to be way before it gets dark is to put your headlamp around your neck. Because when it gets dark, fumbling around looking for a headlamp is not enjoyable. I mean, everything else seems to be okay, so. Shelter's fine. I definitely want the cantonary cut. That way I can put this thing all the way to the ground and have just a little bit more room. So it's a little bit bigger tarp, a little bit more weight, but when bad weather does come in, it's pretty livable. <laughs> ah, good morning. <laughs> ah, ah, good long night. Actually, it slipped really well, but uh, sometime during the night, probably around midnight, I'm laying, I think I'm sleeping, all of a sudden I hear this pssss. Oh no, what's that, what's that? Oh no, the air mattress is damaged. How? That's impossible. I didn't wriggle. Nothing. And I'm looking around. I check the valve. It's all okay. So I, I refill the refill the mattress and it seems fine. And then all of a sudden, pss, like, oh gosh. So I get up and of course it's raining and uh, flashes of lightning. And I start looking around and I find this tiny little slash in the air mattress. I mean, I haven't had this happen in years. And I check for rocks and everything and I, I found where the slash was. And in a little plant under me there was a tiny chip of rock. And that little piece of limestone was as sharp as a razor blade. So even though I didn't wriggle, it was pointing up. I didn't feel it in the plant and slash! <laughs> So of course, air mattress, book. Now, normally I'm prepared, but last night was of course not normal. Uh, <laughs> and so, I couldn't find the patch kit. Awesome. And then I started getting mad thinking, why didn't I just bring my foam Z-Rest or something? Well, the air mattress I sleep better on, but it has the wrist. Z-Rest, don't sleep as well, harder to sleep on the side, zero risk. That's always a balance of these adventures is, you know, I, sleep is super important, but you have to look at what if everything fails. Now, the what if game at people like at work and whatnot, you got to be careful about that because it wipes out your perseverance and resilience and that, that what if thing, what if this goes wrong, ah, jeez, you, you got to just push through. However... Having that patch kit super handy, what if at night? That was a good lesson. I'll have, if I bring my air mattress again, I'll have my patch kit in my pocket. Because, man, I could have fixed that in a minute, cleaned it up, done, and then boom, back to sleep. So, what do you do when you're sleeping on the cold, hard ground in the Rocky Mountains in rain? <laughs> in my little tent. Oh. Or, well, I guess tarp tent thing here. Oh, man. Let's see. So, what I did is, normally, I, uh, oh, let's see, too low. Normally, I sleep with my fleece jacket as a pillow and my shell jacket inside just in case it gets bad. And, man, I, you know, my hips been hurting. I don't want to kill myself, so sleeping on the hard ground, your hips will kill you. So what you do is I took my fleece jacket and I put it under my bum and then wriggle it around and packed it up and that way I could lay there and it was a little cool on my back and then I used my shell jacket as my pillow. It's not that great, but actually it wasn't that bad. I only woke up twice. I think twice, maybe three times. I mean, two to go to the bathroom, so you know, that's no big deal. That's totally normal. But... Not that I'm going to do that again, like, oh, I'll just sleep with my jackets. No! <laughs> but it totally worked! Because I'm laying there with my shell jacket under my backside, and my fleece jacket as my pillow, and I'm like, man, I'm starting to hurt, this is no good. <laughs> so instead, like, oh, dude, what's the most important thing? Your butt and your hips. That's right. Okay, oh, maybe this is PG show now. I shouldn't have said but. We'll bleep that out. Uh, <laughs> so I just put put that fleece jacket under there, wriggled it around, and actually it was pretty good. My shoulders are a little sore. 
I can deal with sore, sore shoulders. Ooh, say that three times as fast. But man, when your hips hurt and your lower back hurts, oh, backpacking is just like misery. Like Batan Death March. So, instead, just use that fleece jacket and uh, good lesson there. It, it was kind of weird last night because I, the, with the cloud cover, the flashes of lightning, I didn't hear any thunder. It was really strange. Ooh, sunrise is coming up. It's getting beautiful here. That's one thing about uh, camping in a low slung tarp is you've got to do everything sideways. So it's a little uh, yoga maneuver on the ground and the mosquitoes come visit. <laughs> Alright. Ah, so here comes the sun. I'll turn this way so I'm not a black outline. Uh, it's, it wasn't too bad. It's surprisingly warm. I've still got my jacket on because the breeze has come up, but it's not bad at all. Uh, it is August, whatever, second or some such thing. First week in August. Nice, nice little place. The, the wind came up at night, and I guess there's this thing called heat lightning. Where the sky flashed, but I didn't hear any boom. I'm not from the Midwest or the East. We don't have that in the West, so it's a little bit different experience. And it's all nice, but boy, once that sun comes up, I'm gonna start going back up the hill. Oh, so this is definitely one that <clears throat> you don't want to dawdle. So I gotta look around here. There's where I slept. Not too bad. Not at all. Survive the storm. Still smiling in one piece. The bear can didn't get bothered. Let's go check that out. All right. Here's the bear can undisturbed. So you have two options, at least in the Rocky Mountains. You can bring a hang bag and you've got to find a limb that's four feet away from the tree, 10 feet up, or you bring the bear canister. Uh, Cause if you can't find a tree, there do not look like there are any good candidate trees here. I don't know. I, I don't like carrying the bear canister, but I had uh, one hiking partner, she got her bear bag with her stuff and socks stuck in the tree, and her and her client or hiking partner could not get that thing out of the tree. Ooh. And the only real effective way in the Sierras is counterbalance. Because the, the bears have figured out, they see that string going up, they just take the string, slash it, and boom, free food. So the, the, the balance and hang thing, in the Rockies apparently the hang thing still works. In the Sierras, no bueno, outlawed, you'll get a ticket, yeah, yeah, yeah I know, I know, I know. But the, the only way is to counterbalance. But I am looking at the trees here, and I see maybe one or two limbs, but they're like 25 feet up. There's no way I'm gonna get up there to get a bear bag up there with a 30 foot rope. And all the rest, yeah, I just don't see that. There's no obvious option to do that here. So, I don't like carrying that bear can, but man, when I've got the bear can, I sleep so well, because I put the bear can away from my tent, I, I don't even have to think about, oh no, a bear's gonna get my food, because I've done that before where I just had it in a bag and couldn't sleep, because the whole time on a four day trip, I kept thinking, oh, a bear's gonna get my food, a bear's gonna get my food. And the bear can, phew, don't even think about it. So, uh, tough. But, we'll uh, look over there, see the objective, Sleeping Indian. Getting there, using an alcohol stove. Works quite well. Of 
Jefferson on film starting it up, but that's a minor detail. Yeah. We got, uh, we got scrambled eggs with bacon. Yum. Those few ounces will be like, I don't care. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. So uh, once you get all your things packed and you get your backpack on you, you think, oh, you're good to go. Just double check and do what we call in Boy Scouts, policing the camp and just look around, flip rocks. More than once I've left something like a spoon or something. just, you know, how am I gonna eat my freeze dry without my trusty titanium sport? Just take a look around and if you happen to find a piece of trash, just throw it in your trash. Never hurts to clean up the forest a little bit and leave it Better than the, how you found it and such. And then the, if you have a pile of stuff where you move things, try and make it look a little more natural, even though obviously people sleep here, but makes it a better experience for everyone. Well, you didn't think I was going to bring my Japanese fishing pole all the way to a lake and not use it and try a little bit of fly fishing with my Tinkara rig. Well, I'll give it a try. It's a little breezy, so it's almost impossible to cast, but I'm not going to come all this way and not at least try and fish. And once you leave Blue Miner, you begin the very long grind up the hill. It's really not that long, but it's pretty steep, so it's really a really nice, uh, really, really, really good place to camp there. Uh, bugs are a little intense, but a little bug juice and it all works out. If you want to head over to Sleeping Indian slash Sheep Mountain, I'll just call, keep call it Sleeping Indian. That slash is too annoying. You're gonna kind of go on an off-trail hike. There's a vague, vague trail here, and that, when I say vague, I mean like your mind thinks it sees something, but there really isn't. So you can go to Blue Miner and then go back out. But the plan is to go all the way up to Sleeping Indian, stand on the bell, and you gotta kind of wander your way through. So this is a the Jim Bridger, Davy Crockett sort of experience where you get to wander through the wilderness and get to where you want to go. One of the fun things is once you get away from the lake, get to this high altitude, 10,000 10, foot plus stuff, the trees are really scrabbly and everything because they can barely hold on life. Almost everything here is low grass or flowers. Nothing really grows up because it's just too harsh up here. Yeah, as a human you can cruise up here, but you try and be here on January, whatever, 14th. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be here. Maybe. It's one thing about these high mountains in the Rockies. It's the snow. Snow never really goes away. It's already August and still sticking. It might melt, but usually there's something. It's just a... Uh, Anything near the Yellowstone Plateau is extra cold. But on top of those mountains, pretty interesting. It's all limestone up here, so it's not shattered rock, but. I was thinking, uh, what kind of caves are in this thing? Because I always thought an old limestone stuff has some sort of caving system. You see pockets where it's like, hey, you know, I bet you just some rocks collapsed, but there's something in there. But it's not like I'm excited to go digging in a cave and get trapped. That would be a bummer. Definitely, it's not going to be a bummer. Planes have actually crashed up here. People have gotten lost. Lightning strike. Yeah, I know. I don't want to be the first caving accident. But it's pretty cool up here. It's very relaxing, 
light breeze, uh, just open field, I mean, no trees up here, maybe one or two back behind me, but that's about it. Oh, green little slime pond. And here we are at the geodetic marker, Sheep Mountain. That thing was placed there in 1946. Even though it's not exactly on the highest point, for some reason this is where they put it. Maybe it's only one of the solid rocks here. So, <laughs> here we are in the world beyond. Of course you gotta walk another 50 yards or whatever to get to the true high point. But, as you walk along, you see the rolling hill in the front, but boy, you walk over here, and <laughs> you know, when you get too close, that crumbles, it'll be over. It's quite the experience to hike from the Slide Lake Road over to Blue Miner and up to the top of Sheep Mountain here. Nice day, unfortunately it's pretty smoky, so I'll tell you the Tetons are there, <laughs> but not quite the case. So it's a two-day backpack. I mean, if you're one of those trail runners, you can bong it out in a couple hours. But for the rest, uh, the wilderness and forest service people like to encourage you to have a more whatever wilderness experience. I don't know what you call it, but that's what I did. It was pretty fun. So well worth the effort. You can come up from either side. Uh, the the front trail is a little off-roading, but much quicker. Uh, the side I came from is like eight or nine miles. Well worth the view on the high point here at 11,000 something or other. I don't know, whatever my watch says, I'll look it up. This is Aaron Linsdale for World Beyond. The world beyond your doorstep, the world beyond your city limits.